You've heard the phrase, it's an open world countless times before, and you probably know what it means, right? Open world games are easy to explain. They're just games that have a big open map where you can go anywhere right from the start and do just about anything you want, without loading zones, of course. All right, cool. Now that we've got that settled, we can tell which games are open world games. So that means this game, this game, and this game are not open world games. But wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. These three games help define the category open world. I guess we're just back to square one. If you ask anyone if Grand Theft Auto 3 is an open world game, certainly their answer would be a resounding yes. And then if you ask them what is an open world game, you might just hear them say, a game where you can go anywhere you want right from the start without loading zones. But GTA 3 has loading zones, and sections of the map are blocked off until you unlock them. So according to the modern standards of open world video games, Grand Theft Auto 3 simply wouldn't be an open world game. And yet I feel dumb saying that Grand Theft Auto 3 isn't an open world, because it obviously is. Something's gotta give. In the same way that you know GTA 3 is an open world, you know that Super Mario Odyssey is not. Both share similarities. You can run around and explore in both of them, you can more or less do whatever you want to do in them, and there is a main goal that the game gives the players. But even with their similarities, Grand Theft Auto 3 is an open world video game and Super Mario Odyssey is not. And this begs the question then, what really is an open world game? I've asked my friends what they thought, and I usually got some of the same answers as what I brought up earlier. After they'd give an answer, I would counter with, well then, insert name of game here is not an open world game because of insert reason here. And while it's true that Zelda Breath of the Wild and Red Dead Redemption 2 don't let the players explore their entirety of their open world right from the start, this doesn't mean that they aren't open world games. Just because Skyrim and Grand Theft Auto 3 have loading zones doesn't make them forfeit the label of an open world video game. And for these same reasons, Pokemon Red and Blue and Xenoblade Chronicles are not open world games. You can theoretically go anywhere you want in each of these examples, as well as many other games, but just because you can explore these vast worlds to your heart's content doesn't automatically make them an open world game. Are you still with me? Look, I know that this is really stupid and confusing, not because it's hard to understand, but because it's just a dumb thought experiment. We just know that some games are open world and some games are not. And there really isn't any rhyme or reason as to what makes them an open world game, but that's what I want to try to get to the bottom of today. So without further ado, let's define the open world. To get our bearings straight, let's do a little dive into the history of open world games. There are three games that, in my opinion, influenced open world games more than any other that proclaimed to be an open world game. Grand Theft Auto 3, Far Cry 3, and Zelda Breath of the Wild. But before getting to those, let's look at the pre-GTA 3 era where you will surprisingly find a lot of open world type games, just before anyone really ever called them that. Open world games and open world concepts have been in gaming for a very long time. As early as the 70s and 80s, many games tried to adopt a free roam style, but it wasn't until Elite in 1984 that the idea of an open world video game was really contextualized. Other games both coming before Elite's release and after also had different takes on open world gameplay. Ultima in 1981, The Legend of Zelda in 1986, Terminator in 1990, Iron Soldier in 1994, and Shenmue in 1999 to name a few. While these and many others like them were essentially open world games, the Grand Theft Auto series is truly where the category gained its popularity, especially following the release of Grand Theft Auto 3 in 2001. Grand Theft Auto 3 was one of the first true or modern open world games. It featured exploration with non-linear gameplay and boasted a reactive world that players could interact with. It pioneered what it meant to be an open world video game and almost single-handedly started the open world gaming trend that we saw in the early 2010s. It wasn't the first open world game, but it set the standard for games that claimed to be open world following its release. And not just open world games, it inspired and influenced the video game industry as a whole for many years to come. The world in Grand Theft Auto 3 is a bustling city that feels alive. It's a real place that's lived in and your character is just another part of it. While other games may have had open world sandboxes before, GTA 3 popularized it. Players felt that they could do whatever they wanted and the NPCs would react to the things that they would do. 
This was heightened by the cheat codes, which added to the sandbox of what was imaginable. Games that followed over the next couple years would improve upon this format in some ways and make innovations of their own in others. Bethesda was doing their own thing with the Elder Scrolls and Fallout series, and you'd see some other pseudo-open-world or open-area-style games like Crisis and Assassin's Creed. But the true kings of the early open world was Rockstar, not only releasing three open world games for the 6th generation consoles, but three more for 7th generation consoles. Each of these franchises seemed to build upon what the last had done, and while there weren't many obvious inspirations across franchises, you know that the devs of these games were watching their competitors closely to see what they could do to improve their open world games. Amidst all of these games and developers was Ubisoft. Ubisoft, like many of the AAA developers at the time, were making open world or open area games and were most likely getting inspiration and influence from other games. Eventually, they were responsible for what I think was the next evolution of open world gameplay, Far Cry 3, released in 2012. Far Cry 3 set the standard of the generic open world video game going forward. It made points of interest on the map exist for a reason, and of course, it started what is commonly referred to as the Ubisoft formula, which includes mechanics like the map uncovering towers. For better or worse, the Ubisoft formula got its beginnings with Far Cry 3, not limited to just the tower system, but also including most of the gameplay features found in these types of games. I personally don't think that this was a bad thing, but it definitely became oversaturated and repetitive in games to come. Before it became that though, Far Cry 3 was unique and innovative in the progression of open world games. Far Cry 3's open world was filled with things to do. Not to say that prior open worlds didn't have things to do, but the map in Far Cry 3 was filled to the brim with outposts, enemy camps, side quests, you name it. It was these mechanics and more that many games more or less copied going forward. Whatever you do in the game impacts your character, and gives players an incentive to explore the open world. For example, you'd get experience for just about anything you did, and you could unlock parts of the map by finding towers or fast travel locations by wiping out enemy camps. Taking out these enemy camps could be done stealthily or loudly, adding to the open world sandbox. This heavily improved the open world sandbox of a game that wasn't simply just set in a big open city. The worlds in Far Cry 3, like Grand Theft Auto, felt alive and lived in. NPCs would not only react and interact with you, but they would also do the same with each other. Wildlife was abundant and also responsive to player and NPC input. Encounters could be done as you saw fit, and players were free to play each interaction however they felt. The games that followed Far Cry 3 clearly borrowed some ideas from it, and even more so when it came to Ubisoft's own properties. And while many of these games followed the formula to a T, there were still a number of games that tried to do something different, or continued with what worked in the past. And it wasn't until the release of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild in 2017 that the open world formula transformed again. Taking inspiration from the Far Cry 3 Ubisoft formula, and innovating themselves, Nintendo released Breath of the Wild which revolutionized the open world format once again. They expanded upon the open world sandbox, created an addictive and rewarding gameplay loop, and added the ability to climb anything and glide anywhere, which felt like obvious additions that I'm surprised didn't show very often in earlier games. The simple innovations that Breath of the Wild made were met with a resounding applause. Many people around the world fell in love with the game, including those who didn't really enjoy open world games before. It vastly improved what you thought you could do in a video game world. Players were no longer limited to what they thought the game could do, instead, they became limited to what they could imagine. Breath of the Wild Sandbox lets players really do just about anything they can think of. If there is a problem that needs to be solved, there is never one answer that must be found. I'm betting that a lot of the problems have been answered in ways that the devs never even intended. Because of this open sandbox, the game became addictive. Each time you would play, you'd come across something new, whether it be from world exploration or gameplay exploration. Every time I boot the game to capture some footage, I can't help but play for hours. I don't just go in and capture what I need and get out, I get absorbed into the world of Hyrule and time goes by without me even realizing it. The ability to climb just about anything and glide anywhere was huge for open worlds. No longer being confined to the obvious climbable rocks and stunted by the fear of fall damage helps players not just see where they want to go, but actually get there. Forms of these mechanics do appear in other games, for example, Far Cry 3 did have a gliding mechanic, but Breath of the Wild's mechanics feel so well implemented that even its imitators don't quite get it right. 
The fact that Breath of the Wild, Far Cry 3, and GTA 3 have imitators is key to why I think they help shape modern open world video games today. Grand Theft Auto had imitation games like Saints Row, Far Cry 3 has a plethora of other Ubisoft games, as well as others like Horizon Zero Dawn, and now Breath of the Wild has games like Genshin Impact and Immortals Phoenix Rising. These three all had impersonators spring up a couple years after their success, and for good reason. They did what they did, but they did it better than the others at the time. Because these games inspired and influenced both open world games and the video game industry as a whole, I think it's fair to determine what an open world game really is by using them as the foundation. Open world games must have an explorable and reactive world that players can delve into and influence. This is pretty simple and probably may be too broad, but if you start to get too narrow, then you could potentially exclude games that should be classified as an open world game. For example, if you include the distinction that the full world must be explorable from the start, then Breath of the Wild and Red Dead Redemption 2 are instantly declassified as an open world game. If you say that open world games can't have loading screens because that divides the open world, then Grand Theft Auto 3 and Elder Scrolls V Skyrim are no longer open world. But what if we did classify an open world game with all of those specifics? Would there be a game out there that actually measures up to every one of our scrutinies about what an open world game actually is? Is it even possible for any game to match up to every one of these requirements that are often stated as what defines an open world video game? Does any game actually fit the bill of an open world game that lets you go anywhere you want right from the very start, the story doesn't prohibit exploration, there aren't any loading zones, the world is react- Minecraft is probably the closest we have to an open world game that truly meets everyone's requirements as to what makes up an open world. In all honesty, you could also probably say No Man's Sky is another true open world game. Essentially, any open world sandbox game could more or less be a true open world. And the only reason that games like Breath of the Wild aren't true open worlds is because they have tutorials, and honestly, I don't think that those tutorials should be skipped. Breath of the Wilds has done exceptionally well, and in my opinion, adds to the overall enjoyment of the game. Grand Theft Auto and Far Cry use the tutorial section as storytelling, which is something that Minecraft lacks. More and more games are including open world elements into their gameplay. Take Fortnite for example. Have you seen Fortnite recently? It's basically what Far Cry 3 was in 2012, but along with NPCs trying to kill you, there are other players trying to kill you as well. The world is vast and reactive to your input. It has plenty of places to explore to the point that they even gray out parts of the map you have yet to visit. For all intents and purposes, it is an open world game. And not just Fortnite. All battle royales are basically open world games or have open world elements. God of War 2018, Gears 5, Xenoblade Chronicles, Bloodborne, and more all have some form of open world design to them. Sure, you may not classify these games and others as open world, but honestly, who really cares? Games are all the better because of how open worlds innovate gameplay and inspire other developers to make their game even better. This whole idea of defining the open world came to me originally because of Pokemon Legends Arceus. During its promotional phase before release, no one really knew what kind of game it was going to be. It looked like it was going to be an open world game doing the whole Breath of the Wild stand on the cliff thing, but that and some snippets of gameplay was all we really had to go off of. However, there was one giveaway that only a small number of people picked up on. The Pokemon Company and Nintendo specifically never used the wording open world in any of its promotional material. On the flip side, when Pokemon Scarlet and Violet were announced, they screamed at the top of their lungs that this was going to be the first open world Pokemon game. And of course they did. Open world is a buzzword that gets people talking. And wouldn't you believe it? Legend is more of an open area type game like Monster Hunter, and Scarlet and Violet is a traditional open world game. As interesting as this subject is, I do think that getting to the specifics needlessly complicates things. I do, however, think that it is good to leave the definition broad. In reality, we really don't even need a definition, because if you ask someone, is Grand Theft Auto 3 an open world game, they of course would say yes. And if you ask that same person, is Super Mario Odyssey an open world game, obviously they would say no. We all inherently know what an open world game is, so we don't necessarily need something to tell us if it is or if it isn't. 